Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's Dirty Psychiatry series. In this video, we're going to be talking about all of the bipolar spectrum disorders. This is what we're going to be covering today. We'll begin by discussing the symptoms of all of the bipolar spectrum disorders, and these are sometimes referred to as the dig fast symptoms. We'll then touch specifically on bipolar 1 disorder, bipolar 2 disorder, and cyclothymia. We'll also briefly mention some of the treatments for bipolar disorder, but the treatments for bipolar disorder, which are by and large mood stabilizers, will actually be covered in their own video. So let's just begin by talking about the symptoms that typically present in somebody who's suffering from one of these bipolar spectrum disorders. Now you may have heard of SIG E CAPS symptoms when people talk about major depressive disorder. And just like in major depression, with its SIG E CAPS symptoms, mania, which is the, the focal point of the bipolar spectrum disorders or the classic presentation, is made up of its own acronym of symptoms, and these symptoms are called DIG FAST. D I G F A S T. And you should be familiar with what each of these letters stands for because each of these symptoms are part of the criteria for things like bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and cyclothymia. So let's go through this. The D stands for distractibility. So this is the ability to, dis to distract somebody. It's like they start one task and then they see some kind of stimulus out of the left part of their eye and then they, they stop what they're doing and they do something else. And then they're doing some other task and then they stop what they're doing because someone starts talking to them and then they engage with that person. So sort of bouncing around like that and being easily distracted is called distractibility. The I stands for impulsivity and this is classically risk-taking impulsive behavior. So the manic patient might do some things like get on top of a moving train and ride on top of the train or climb up an electrical pole and and like move down the wire to the next pole. So very impulsive, risk-taking, dangerous behavior that's out of character for what the patient might typically do if they were not manic. Grandiosity is what the G stands for. So being grandiose means that you believe yourself to be more important than you actually are. And when somebody has bipolar 1 and they're manic, they might believe that they are Jesus or that they are God. So that's grandiosity. Sometimes they could believe that they have special abilities or that somebody who has never gone to college before might understand really complex astrophysics or, or something like that. So that's grandiosity. The F stands for flight of ideas, and a flight of ideas is just a nonstop, rapid idea that comes to the brain and co usually comes out of their mouth in the form of very rapid and uninterruptible speech. So when you're talking to somebody who's manic or talking to a patient which has any of the bipolar spectrum disorders, you might notice that the rate of their speech is so fast that you can't even interrupt them to get a word in. So the flight of ideas is the thought content portion of it. And then it comes out of their mouth as the really rapid speech, which is the T at the end of this mnemonic, which is talkativeness. So flight of ideas and talkativeness sort of go together. But the flight of ideas is the content in their brain, which translates into the really fast, rapid speech that's uninterruptible, which is the T in talkativeness that comes out of their mouth. The A is activity, and this is increased goal-directed activity. Classically, patients who are manic will begin projects or have some type of endeavor that they're starting. An example might be somebody who wants to save all of the starving children in Africa. So they go to a bookstore and they buy thousands of books and then they go to a UPS store or a FedEx and they buy all of these boxes to ship all of these books to and they get to the store and they realize that they don't have enough money and then they abandon that task and they start a different task to save all of the starving children in Africa. So they go back to the supermarket and they start buying all of the bags of Hershey bars that are there at the checkout aisle because they're going to send all of these Hershey bars to Africa and they're sort of bouncing from one goal to the next even though it's never going to be completed in most cases and it's unrealistic. S is sleep and specifically this is a decreased need for sleep. Now this is really important and I want to pause for a second. Both patients that are depressed and patients that are manic are going to have changes in their sleep. And it's really important that you understand this difference, especially for step two, level two, and beyond, because test writers can actually get you here. So 
In the depressed patient, they're going to usually have trouble sleeping. But even though they're having trouble sleeping, they're still tired the next day. Because if you only sleep two or three hours a night, you're obviously going to feel tired the next day because you didn't sleep. That's your depressed patient. It's like you or me. If we don't sleep, we're going to be tired. But in the manic patient, there's a decreased need for sleep. So not only are they only sleeping two to three hours, but they still maintain that incredibly high energy level and they're not tired. So it's a decreased need for sleep, not trouble sleeping. And that subtlety is very high yield because if a test writer writes a question, they might put in the question stem that the patient only slept for two hours. And then it's your job to figure out is this depression that I'm seeing the depressed phase of a bipolar illness? Because as you'll learn later in this video, patients who are bipolar fluctuate between high energy manic states and low energy depressed states. Or is this someone who's just simply depressed and has major depressive disorder and they only have depression, which would be called unipolar depression. Unipolar for one pole because you're only down and depressed. You're not bipolar. Bipole means two poles. You're not up and manic and down and depressed. So that's a very, very high yield point about sleep. And then T, again, we've already talked about this. That's talkativeness. So these are called the dig fast symptoms. And these are to mania what SIG E caps are to depression. So you absolutely need to know these symptoms because they're going to be described in the clinical vignettes of your questions. So now that you understand what the symptoms look like, let's talk about bipolar 1 disorder specifically. So the criteria for bipolar 1 disorder is that you have a manic episode plus or minus a depressive episode, okay? So it doesn't matter whether or not you, you know that they ever were depressed or you hear that they were ever depressed. If the patient has a manic episode, they are immediately diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder. Stop what you're doing. The diagnosis is bipolar 1. So you don't have to worry about bipolar 1 versus bipolar 2 versus cyclothymia. If they have a manic episode, it's bipolar 1. Done. End of discussion. So let's talk about what a manic episode really consists of. So a manic episode is four of seven dig fast symptoms. So those symptoms that we just talked about, if you have at least four of them, it's a manic episode if it lasts for at least one week. So four of seven dig fast symptoms that last for at least one week is a manic episode. Or, now this is the very high yield point for step two, level two, and beyond. If the patient gets hospitalized, so they go to an acute inpatient psychiatric unit, or they present with psychotic features and there's a known history of some bipolar spectrum disorder, it automatically qualifies as a manic episode. It automatically qualifies as bipolar 1 disorder. So I want to be very clear here. If you're taking your test and they give you at least four of those dig fast symptoms that last for at least one week, and they'll always give you the timeline, so make sure you read it in the question. If there's at least four dig fast symptoms lasting for at least seven days, it's a manic episode. And that means because it's mania, it's bipolar one. So in bipolar two, you don't get mania. You get something else called hypomania, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. In cyclothymia, you get alternating hypomania with something called dysthymia, which we'll touch on in a bit. But the only bipolar spectrum disorder that actually features a true manic episode is bipolar 1 disorder. So I'm repeating myself several times here because this is so high yield. Please know this. Four of seven dig fast symptoms lasting for at least one week makes you bipolar 1. Stop what you're doing and pick the answer. Or if you get a patient that kind of sounds like in the vignette that they're, they might be bipolar, maybe the, qu the question writer is a real pain in the ass and they, they give you like three symptoms of dig fast, but they tell you that the patient ends up admitted to inpatient psychiatry, it's bipolar one disorder because as long as they're getting admitted to the hospital, it's a, it, it automatically qualifies as bipolar one disorder. Same thing with psychotic symptoms. Don't worry about the subtleties here, just memorize four of seven dig fast symptoms for at least one week is a manic episode, and that qualifies as bipolar one disorder. Now, the plus or minus depressive episode is there because you've probably been taught that bipolar means two poles, and you're shifting between mania, which is the up, and depression, which is the down. And it's absolutely true that the patient is going to have both manic and depressed episodes, but it's the manic episode that will seal the diagnosis for you. So how do you remember this, right? How do you remember this really important high yield 
clinical information that I've probably repeated five or six times already. Well, for bipolar disorder, I want you to remember that mania is one fun week. So you have one fun week. It lasts for seven days. It's four of seven dig fast symptoms for at least seven days or at least one week. So one fun week. And if we compare that against major depressive disorder, or MDD, major depression is two blue weeks. So there's one fun week for mania and two blue weeks for depression. Okay. One fun week for bipolar and two blue weeks for depression. So really, really awesome mnemonic, easy to remember. Please memorize this. Four of seven for at least one week is bipolar one. Now, this is what we've talked about so far, and I want to illustrate this on a little graph so you can understand what bipolar 1 disorder looks like in terms of its clinical fluctuation. So here's euthymia in the middle of the graph, and euthymia just pretty much means normal mood. It doesn't, you're not depressed, you're not down, you're not manic, you're not up. But bipolar 1 disorder on a graph looks like this. So in the red phase of the graph, the patient is manic, so they're up. Their mood is more expansive. It's maybe more irritable. It's up from euthymia, so it's manic. And the depression phase is obviously down and blue. So if you're the you know going down and you're getting worse than euthymic, then you're going to be depressed. So it's this fluctuation between the manic episode and the depressed episode that categorizes bipolar 1 disorder. And again, it's important to remember that for bipolar 1, you have to have a manic episode, plus or minus the depressed episode. So in bipolar 1 disorder, if we wanted to treat this, what we would do is we would want to fix the mania and bring it back down to euthymia, which you see there in the red phase of the graph. And if we wanted to treat depression, we would want to push that blue part of the graph back up to euthymia and treat the depression. And the way that we do that is with different drugs. And this is just going to be a quick overview of mood stabilizers, but mood stabilizers will get their own video. So to, to fix the manic portion, we would use mood stabilizers such as lithium, valproic acid, carbamazepine, olanzapine, and risperidone. Now, mood stabilizers, even though it's one big category, which are drugs that stabilize your mood, actually are drugs that come from different categories. So lithium in and of itself is considered a mood stabilizer. But valproic acid and carbamazepine are actually anti-epileptic drugs that are used as mood stabilizers. Olanzapine and risperidone are atypical or second generation antipsychotics that are used as mood stabilizers. So these are really used in, in its own category, even though each of these drugs comes from different categories. And then to fix the depressed phase of bipolar 1 disorder, you would also use mood stabilizers, which are things like lithium again, lamotrigine, olanzapine plus an SSRI, lorazidone, quetiapine. So again, we're pulling different drugs from different categories and using them to treat the bipolar spectrum disorders because all of these drugs, whether they're antipsychotics or whether they're anti-epileptics, all have mood stabilizing properties and fix the manic episode or the fluctuation between mania and depression. Now, something that's incredibly high yield to know is that you never, ever give an SSRI alone to a patient that's manic or a patient that has bipolar 1 and is in the, the mania portion or bipolar 2 as in, in, in the hypomania portion. You never give them an SSRI alone. And the reason for that is, let's take an example. Let's say that you had a patient who was exhibiting this this uh, switching from mania to depression, and you want to treat the depressed phase. Maybe you didn't know that they had bipolar disorder. Let's pretend for a second you were like, huh, I see that someone is having symptoms of depression. Maybe it's major depressive disorder. Let me give them an SSRI. So you give them an SSRI, and when you introduce the SSRI, you push the depressed part of this graph up to euthymia. And you're like, oh, cool. I'm an amazing medical student. I suggested that the patient get an SSRI, and now their depression is gone. But what happens to the patient with bipolar 1 disorder is that you push them past euthymia. And unfortunately, you flip them into mania. Because by reversing the depressed part, you overcorrect and flip them right into mania. So high yield, never give an SSRI alone to a manic patient. So this is what we've talked about so far. And again, mood stabilizers in terms of mechanism, adverse drug reactions, and all of the high yield clinical tidbits will get their own video. And that's coming. But now let's switch gears and talk about bipolar 2 disorder. So bipolar 2 is a lot like bipolar 1. And the major difference here is that instead of a manic episode, 
these patients get hypomanic episodes. They get hypomanic episodes usually with a much more prominent major depressive episode, but what what the difference is here is that instead of mania, it's hypomania. So hypo means less, so it's less mania. So it's a manic episode that's a little bit less than a true manic episode. So let's talk about criteria. For hypomania, you need three of seven dig fast symptoms for at least four days. And they're never manic, so they're not four or more symptoms for one week, which was the criteria for mania in bipolar one. And they never get psychotic features because if they got psychotic features, they would either be diagnosed with bipolar one disorder or they'd be diagnosed with something like schizoaffective disorder bipolar type. But in this case, it's three of seven. So it's less than the criteria for mania. And it's only for four days instead of seven. So it's hypomania, less mania. So they're still going to present with symptoms that sound like they're manic, right? Their speech might be really fast and they might have increased goal-directed activity. Maybe they're a little grandiose, but they're not going to have the full spectrum of symptoms that would lend itself to a diagnosis of mania and therefore bipolar 1. So this is bipolar 2 hypomania. So how do you remember this criteria? Well, I've got an awesome mnemonic for you. So I want you to remember hypo Mainthria. So hypo has four letters, which reminds me that you need this for at least four days. And instead of saying mania, I say mainthria. Mainthria. Three, because you need three of seven dig fast symptoms. So hypomainthria is how I remember the hypomanic episode criteria. And again, hypo has four letters, so this lasts for at least four days. And mainthria, three for three of seven dig fast symptoms. So that is bipolar 2 disorder. And just to illustrate this, let's go back to the graph. So this is the graph that I showed you for bipolar 1 disorder. There was the manic episode that flipped into depressive episodes, and the patient would alternate between the two. But since hypomania is a little bit less than mania, if we just bump that red part of the graph down a little bit, this is what bipolar 2 looks like. So the patient will alternate between these hypomanic episodes and these major depressive episodes. It's three of seven dig fast symptoms for at least four days when they're in the hypomanic part. And when they're in the major depressive part, it's just the criteria for major depressive disorder. So, you know, you're at least five SIG ECAP symptoms for at least two weeks. So that's bipolar 2 disorder. And the way that we treat it is really the same way that we treat bipolar 1 with a little bit more of an emphasis on the mood stabilizers in the blue column here. So more in the realm of giving quetiapine or lorazidone, which are atypical second generation antipsychotics. But the subtleties of that are beyond the, the scope of this lecture and mood stabilizers will get their own video. So that's bipolar two disorder. Let's talk about cyclothymia. So a lot of people, a lot of medical students get really caught up on exams with the terminology here of cyclothymia and dysthymia and all the things that end with thymia. So let's talk about criteria. So cyclothymia, cyclo means cycling or alternating, and thymia is how we talk about mood. So right, euthymia is normal mood. Dysthymia is dys, like dysphoric or not working mood, which typically means someone is slightly depressed. So cyclothymia is alternating mood. So what's the criteria? The patient's going to have hypomanic episodes and dysthymic episodes. And I'll talk about what each of these terms refers to. So we already talked about hypomanic episodes. We, in fact, we just talked about it. It's three of seven dig fast symptoms for greater than four days. So three, at least four days, three of seven dig fast symptoms. So the patient has hypomanic episodes, but when they're not hypomanic, they're having dysthymic episodes. And dysthymic episodes are greater than two and less than four, or less than four, excuse me, I should say greater than two and no more than four, so four or less, SIG ECAPS symptoms. And it does not meet criteria for major depressive disorder. So it's sort of like baby depression. So if you want to think about cyclothymia in a really simple way, it's baby mania alternating with baby depression. They never meet criteria for mania. They never meet criteria for a major depressive episode. But they're still a little hypomanic and they're a little depressed at times. So they're flipping between them. So if we put this on a graph, instead of mania and major depression, it's going to be hypomania and dysthymia. So the patient's going to alternate like this. They're going to have episodes where they're up, but not fully up because they're just hypomanic. And in those red parts of the graph, they'll have three of seven dig fast symptoms for at least four days. But when they're down, they're not going to be down to the point where you're going to diagnose them or think that they have major depressive disorder. 
but they're still going to be like, you know, a little depressed. They're going to have at least two, but no more than four SIG E cap symptoms of depression that never meets criteria for MDD. So this is how cyclothymia looks on our mood graph. So very, very important to know. So just memorize that cyclothymia, which means alternating mood, is hypomanic episodes mixed with dysthymic episodes. And this alternation happens for at least two years. High yield, it happens for at least two years. Okay, that is cyclothymia. Let's briefly wrap up this video by just talking about some other causes of mania that you could see on your exams that won't be things like bipolar 1, bipolar 2, or cyclothymia, but the patient will still present with the dig fast symptoms. So these are some things you should just keep in mind. Steroids, if a patient is being started on steroids for some type of inflammatory condition, they can become manic from the steroid. You can get substance-induced mania, so if someone's doing cocaine or methamphetamine, any stimulant really can cause mania. Drug-induced, so I don't mean illicit drug, I mean, per, you know, like prescription drug. Different drugs are known to cause mania, and that's really all you need to know for the purposes of uh, step one, level one, step two, level two. And then you can get autoimmune-induced mania. So some people with autoimmune conditions, such as lupus, can become manic if the disease is not managed correctly. Neurosyphilis and HIV can cause mania. Subacute combined degeneration due to a vitamin B12 deficiency can cause mania. Hyperthyroidism is huge. Uh, thyroid disease is the great masquerader. Um, Lyme's disease, Lyme disease, which I did not put on the slide, can cause mania. And then, you know, Wilson's disease. There's a lot more causes, but I'm just listing some stuff that you might see pop up because there are neuropsychiatric manifestations of all of these disease processes. So keep these in the back of your mind. But that's it for this video. I hope that you now understand the bipolar spectrum of disorders. I hope that you understand dig fast symptoms, the criteria for each of these three different disorders, and what they look like on graphs. If you've enjoyed this video, please know that more psychiatry videos are coming, and you'll be an expert by the time that they are done.